Hi, this is Father Ted Topsis. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Contemplative Spiritual Readings. Today I will be reading to you the work On Faith, which is from St. Simeon the New Theologian, and it includes his experience of the uncreated light of God. It is believed that the person he is referring to by the name of George is actually himself. Um, but this is something that we don't know absolutely, but we believe that it is the case, and it is describing faith and the experience of God. This is from the fourth volume of the Philokalia. This is compiled by St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain and St. Macarius of Corinth. It was translated from the Greek into English by G. E. H. Palmer, Philip Sherrard, and Metropolitan College to Swear. And it is published by Faber and Faber. So it's page 16 of the fourth volume of the Philokalia. Brethren and fathers, it is good that we make God's mercy known to all and speak to those close to us of the compassion and inexpressible bounty he has shown us. For as you know, I neither fasted nor kept vigils, nor slept on bare ground, but to borrow the psalmist's words, I humbled myself, and in short, the Lord saved me. Or to put it even more briefly, I did no more than believe, and the Lord accepted me. Many things stand in the way of acquiring humility, but there is nothing that prevents us from having faith. For if we want it with all our heart, it will immediately become active in us, since it is God's gift to us and a preeminent characteristic of our nature, even though it is also subject to our individual power or free will. That is why even the Scythians and other largest peoples have faith in each other's words, yet to demonstrate through actual facts the effects of our deeply rooted faith, and to confirm what I have just said, I will tell you a story related to me by someone who was entirely trustworthy. A man by the name of George, young in age, he was about twenty, was living in Constantinople during our times. He was good-looking and so studied in dress, manners, and gait that some of those who take note only of outer appearances and hardly judge the behavior of others began to harbor malicious suspicions about him. This young man then made the acquaintance of a holy monk who lived in one of the monasteries in the city, and to him he opened his soul, and from him he received a short rule which he had to keep in mind. He also asked him for a book giving an account of the ways of monks and other and their ascetic practices. So the elder gave him the work of Mark the Monk on the Spiritual Law. This the young man accepted as though it had been sent by God himself, and in the expectation that he would reap richly from it, he read it from end to end with eagerness and attention. And though he benefited from the whole work, there were three passages only which he fixed in his heart. The first of these three passages reads as follows. If you desire spiritual health, listen to your conscience, do all it tells you, and you will benefit. The second passage read, He who seeks the energies of the Holy Spirit before he has actively observed the commandments is like someone who sells himself into slavery and who, as soon as he is bought, again asks to be given his freedom while still keeping his purchase money. And the third passage said the following, Blind is the man crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. He prays with his body alone, and yet not, not, not yet with spiritual knowledge, but when the man once blind received his sight and saw the Lord, he acknowledged him no longer as the son of David, but as the son of God, and worshipped him. On reading these three passages, the young man was struck with awe and fully believed that if he examined his conscience, he would benefit, that if he 
practice the commandments, he would experience the energy of the Holy Spirit, and that through the grace of the Holy Spirit he would recover his spiritual vision and would see the Lord. Wounded thus with love and desire for the Lord, he expectantly sought his primal beauty, however hidden it might be. And he assured me he did nothing else except carry out every evening before he went to bed the short rule given to him by the holy elder. When his conscience told him, make more prostrations, recite also psalms and repeat, Lord have mercy more often, for you can do so, he read readily and unhesitantly obeyed and did everything as though asked to do it by God himself. And from that time on, he never went to bed with his conscience reproaching him, saying, Why have you not done this? Thus he followed it scrupulously, and as daily it increased its demands, and in a few days he had greatly added to his evening office rule. During the day, he was in charge of the patrician's household, and each day he went to the palace, engaging in the task demanded by such a life, so that no one was aware of his other pursuits. Every evening tears flowed from his eyes. He multiplied the prostrations he made, and his face to the ground, his feet together rooted to the spot on which he stood. He prayed assiduously to the mother of God with sighs and tears, and as though the Lord was physically present, he fell at his most pure feet. While like the blind man he besought mercy and asked that the eyes of his soul should be opened. As his prayers lasted longer every evening, he continued in this way until midnight, never growing slack or indolent during this period, his whole body under control, not moving his eyes or looking up. He stood still as a statue or a bodiless spirit. One day, as he stood repeating more in his intellect, then with his mouth the words, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Suddenly a profuse flood of divine light appeared above him and filled the whole room. As this happened, the young man lost his bearings, forgetting whether he was in a house or under a roof, for he saw nothing but light around him and did not even know that he stood upon the earth. He had no fear of falling or awareness of the world, nor did any of these, those things that beset men and bodily beings enter his mind. Instead, he was wholly united to the non-material light, so much so that it seemed to him that he himself had been transformed into light. Oblivious of all else, he was filled with tears and inexpressible joy and gladness. Then his intellect ascended to heaven and beheld another light, more lucid than the first. Miraculously there appeared to him, standing close to that light, the holy angelic elder of whom we have spoken and who had given him the short rule of and the book. When I heard this story, I thought, how greatly the intercession of the saint had helped the young man, and how God had chosen to show him to what heights of virtue the holy man had attained. When this vision was over, the young man, as he told me, had come back to himself. He was struck with joy and amazement. He wept with all his heart, and sweetness mingled his tears. Finally he fell on his bed, and at that moment the cock crowed, announcing the middle of the night. Shortly after, the church bells rang for matins, and he got up as usual to chant the office, not having had a thought of sleep during the whole night, as God knows, for he brings things about according to decisions of which he alone is aware. All this happened without the young man having done anything more 
than you have heard. But what he did, he did with true faith and unhesitating expectation. And let it not be said that he did these things by way of an experiment, for he had never spoken or thought of acting in such a spirit. Indeed, to make experiments and to try things out is evidence of a lack of faith. On the contrary, after rejecting every passion charged and self-indulgent thought, this young man, as he himself assured me, paid such attention to what his conscience said that he regarded all material things of life with indifference, and he did not even find pleasure in food and drink or want to partake of them frequently. You have heard, my brethren, what great things faith in God can bring about when it is confirmed by actions. You will have realized that youth is not to be despised, and that without understanding and fear of God old age is useless. You have learned that the heart of a city cannot prevent us from practicing God's commandments so long as we are diligent and watchful, nor can stillness or withdrawal from the world be of any benefit if we are lazy and negligent. We have certainly all heard of David, and we admire him and say that he, he is unique and there cannot be another like him. Yet here, lo and behold, is something more than David. For David was specially chosen by God. He was anointed to be prophet and king. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he was granted many revelations concerning God. Thus, when he sinned, and was deprived of the grace of the Spirit, of and his of his gift of prophecy, he was estranged from his usual communion with God. Is there anything astonishing in the fact that he should recall the state of grace from which he had fallen, and should ask to enjoy these privileges once more? But our young man had never even conceived of any of these things. He was devoted only to what is transient and worldly, and he could imagine nothing superior to such things, yet how unpredictable are the ways, Lord. He had only to hear of the divine realities, and he believed in them immediately. Indeed, he believed so surely that he Im 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 implemented his faith in corresponding action. It was thanks to this action that his mind took wing and rose to heaven, drawing to it the compassion of Christ's mother. Through her intercession, God was appeased and bestowed on him the grace of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> this gave him the strength to rise to heaven, and to behold the light that every one longs for, but very few attain. This young man had not observed long fast, or slept on the ground, worn a hair shirt, or shaved his head, nor had he shunned the world physically, though he had in spirit. By keeping a few vigils, yet he appeared to be superior to Lot, so renowned, in Sodom, or rather, yet, although in a body, he was an angel, constrained yet unconstrained, visible but transcending physically, human in appearance, but immaterial when he perceived spiritually, outwardly, all things to men, but inwardly, solely present to God alone, the knower of all things. Thus, when the visible sun set, he found that its place was taken by a tender light of spiritual luminosity, which is the pledge and foretaste of the unceasing light that is to succeed it. And this was as it should be, for the love of God for which he was searching took him out of the world beyond nature and all material things, filling him wholly, 
with spirit and transforming him into light. And all this happened to him while he was still living in the middle of the city and was a steward of a house, having in his charge slaves and free men and carrying out all the tasks incumbent of such a life. E enough has been said in praise of this young man and to stimulate you to a similar longing in imitation of him. Or would you still like me to speak of other things greater than these, things which perhaps you might not be able to take in? Yet what can be greater or more perfect than the fear of God? Indeed, nothing is greater than this. It is, as St. Gregory of Nazianzus has written, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. For when there is fear, there the commandments are kept, and where the commandments are kept, the flesh is purified together with the cloud that envelops the soul and prevents it from clearly seeing the divine radiance. Where there is this purification, there is illumination, and illumination is the fulfillment of the longing of those who desire the greatest in all supernal things, or even that which is above all greatness. With these words he showed that illumination by the soul is the endless end of every virtue, and that whoever attains has finished with everything sensory and has begun to experience the knowledge of spiritual realities. Such, my brethren, are the wonders of God, and God reveals his hidden saints so that some may emulate them and others have no excuse for doing so, provided they have a worthy life. Both those who dwell in monasteries, mountains, caves, and can achieve salvation solely because their faith in God bestows great blessings on them. Hence, those who, because of their laziness, have fall, failed to attain salvation will have no excuse to offer on the day of judgment. For he who proclaimed, who promised to grant us salvation simply on account of our faith in him is not a liar. So show mercy to yourselves and to us who love you, and often grieve and shed tears for you. For this is what the merciful and compassionate God asks us to do. Trust in the Lord with all your soul. Leave the world and everything that passes away, and draw close to God and cleave to him. For in a little while heaven and earth will pass away, and apart from him there will be no firm ground on which to stand, no limit nothing to check the fall of sinners. God is infinite and cannot be grasped. Tell me, then, if you can, what place there will be for those who fall away from his kingdom. I grieve and exha I exhaust my heart. I pine for you when I bring to mind that we have the Lord so bountiful and compassionate that, s that simply if we have faith in him, he grants us gifts beyond our imagination, gifts we have never heard of, or heard or thought of, and that man's heart has not grasped. Yet we, like beasts, prefer the earth and the things of the earth that through his great mercy it yields in order to support, supply our bodily needs. And if we use these things modestly, then our soul may ascend unhampered toward, towards divine realities, nourished spiritually by the Holy Spirit, according to the degree of purification to the level to which we have ascended. This is our purpose. For this we were created and brought forth, that after having received lesser blessings in the world in this world, we may, through our gratitude to God and our love for Him, enjoy great things and eternal blessings in the life to come. But alas, far from having any concern for the blessing in store, we are ever grateful, even grateful. For those at hand, and we are like the demons, or, if truth be told, even worse. Thus we deserve greater punishment than they, for we have been given greater blessings. 
For we know that God became for our sakes like us in everything except sin, so that he might deliver us from the delusion and free us from sin. But what is the use of saying this? The truth is that we believe in all things, these things, only as words, while we deny them where our acts are concerned. Is not Christ's name uttered everywhere, in towns and villages, in monasteries, on mountains, such, dil such diligently, if you will, and find out whether anyone keeps his commandments? Among thousands of myriads you will sacrifice, scarcely find one who is a Christian, both in word and in act. Did not our Lord and God say in the gospel, He that believes in me will also do what I do. Indeed, he will do greater things. John 14 But which of us da dares to say, I do Christ's works, and I truly believe in Christ? Do you not see, brethren, that on the day of judgment we risk being classed among the unbelievers, and will be chastised more severely than those ignorant of Christ. Inevitably, either we must be chastised as unbelievers or Christ is a liar, and that, my brethren, is impossible. I have written this not to dissuade you from withdrawing from the world or even or to encourage you to live in the midst of it, Rather, I have written it so that all who happen to read it may be assured that whoever wants to act rightly will receive from God the power so to do whatever he may be. In fact, the tale I, I have told actually encourages withdrawal. For if the young man in question who lived in the world and never had a thought of renouncing it or of shedding his possessions, or of submitting to the rule of obedience, received such mercy from God simply because he trusted in him and called on him with his whole soul. How much greater blessing should those hope to attain who have abandoned the worldly things, all worldly relationships, and who, as God commanded, have for his, for his sake surrendered their very souls. Luke 14. Moreover, if unhesitatingly you're in your faith and wholeheartedly in your determination, you do begin to act rightly to expo experience the blessing that comes from doing so, you will of your own accord realize that worldly cares and living in the world are a great obstacle to those who wish to live in conformity with God. What we have related about this young man is amazing and unexpected, and we have never heard of anything like it happening to anyone else, even though it may have happened to others or may, or may, may happen in the future, they should realize that they will lose the blessing they have received unless they do promptly abandon the world that is exactly what i learned from this young from that young man I subsequently met him after he had become a monk or the th in the third or fourth year of the monastic life he was then 32 i knew him very well and had been friends from childhood and had been brought up together on account of this, he told me the following a few days after that incredible change in my life and more and the more than human help I received, I was continuously attacked by the temptations of my worldly life, temptations that thwarted my secret activities and that little by little deprived me of the blessings I had been given. As a result, I longed to get completely away from the world in and in solitude to seek out him who had appeared to me. For, brother, I was convinced that he had appeared to me solely in order to draw me unworthy as I was to himself and to separate me, separate me entirely from the world, yet lacking the strength 
to respond straight away, I gradually forgot everything I have told you about and fell into utter darkness to such an extent and no longer remembered or even though thought of anything major or minor connected with those experiences. Rather, I plunged into evil ways more deeply than ever before and ended up in such a state that it was as if I had never understood or heard Christ's holy words. Even the saints who had once shown me such mercy and had been given me that a short rule and had sent me the book became for me merely someone I had happened to meet, and I gave no thought to the things I, I had seen because of him. I am telling you this, he continued, so that you can see quite clearly the pit of perdition into which I fell, contemptible and I was, because of my sloth and negligence, and so you will be filled with amazement at the inexpressible blessing that God subsequently bestowed on me. For though I did not know how to explain it, unknown to myself, love and trust trust toward that saintly elder had remained in my unhappy heart. And it was, I think, for this reason, as a result of his prayers, after many years, God, in his compassion, had mercy on me. Through him, God had again dragged me out of the chronic state of delusion and rescued me from the pit of evil. In spite of my unworthiness, I had not become broken with the el completely broken with the elder, but when I was in the city, I often visited him in his cell and confessed to him what had happened to me, although without conscience I, as I was. I did not carry out any of his instructions, but now, as you see, the merciful God has forgiven my many sins, and through that some saintly elder has granted me, the same saintly elder has granted me the grace to become a monk, and in spite of my being truly unworthy of it, has permitted me to be constantly with him. After great labors and many tears, combining with strict solitude, total obedience, the complete elimination of my own will, and many other rigorous practices and actions, I have been going forward res resolutely and unremittingly along my path, and have again been granted a vision, faint as it is, of a small ray of that most gentle divine light. Although up to now I have not been privileged to see it, as I saw it on that original occasion. This and many other things he told me with tears, and I, hapless that I am, as I listened to his holy words, realized that he was entirely filled with divine grace and was truly wise despite his lack of worldly wisdom. Moreover, since he had acquired the unerring knowledge of spiritual realities through actual experience, I asked him to tell me how faith could bring about such miracles and instruct me by setting it down in writing. He began to speak to me about these matters and was quite ready to write down his observations. So not, not to lengthen this present text, I have set forth what he said elsewhere for the delight of those who seek with faith to learn of such writings. Thus I beg you, brethren, in Christ, let us diligently follow the path of Christ's commandments, so that our faces are not covered in shame. To everyone who knocks resolutely, he opens the gates of his kingdom. And on him who asks, he at once bestows the Holy Spirit. Luke 11.13 nor is it possible for the persons who seek with all his souls not to find, Matthew 7, and not to be enriched with the richness of his gifts. Thus you too will be nourished with by the inexpressible blessings that he has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2 Here in this present life, you will enjoy them in part in accordance with his supernal wisdom, while in the life to come you will enjoy them fully in company 
with saints of all time in Christ our Lord, to whom belong glory throughout the ages. Amen. I pray this reading was beneficial to you. Again, that was from St. Simeon, the New Theologian on Faith in the fourth volume of the Philokalia. I pray it is a great blessing to you. May God bless you and God be with you and forgive me, the sinful servant of God. God bless you.